Okay, great. So uh, the next paper is on anamorphic encryption, private communication against a dictator by Pino Persiano, Duong, Hyun Fan, and Moti Young. And Pino will give the talk. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Almost the last session. Okay, so this is anamorphic encryption. It's work with uh, you, Fan, and Moti, who is not here. Okay, so let's see how this works. Okay, so privacy is a basic human right. And okay, it's in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, it's very well taken as a basic human rights in most countries. And, um, and cryptography, uh, we are proud to, to have done, you know, been very successful in providing tools for encrypting. So for example, just to mention one, it's the Signal Protocol and, and the app, which most of us have on, on the cell phone, which will give us some, uh, some degree of privacy in communication. But um, we observed in this, in this paper that the success of cryptography in protecting privacy be, uh, relies on two assumptions uh, that are very, uh, you know, they are quite obvious. So we take it, we take them from granted, but they might be challenged in a dictator, in dictator, in a dictatorship. Okay, so bear with me with for two slides. These are quite obvious. First of all, so encryption guarantees privacy of the message only with respect to parties that do not have access to the secret key, obviously, okay? This is codified in the Indies PA game. And the assumption is that the receiver, the owner of the secret key is able to keep the secret key in a private location, okay? The second observation with, with uh, uh, an ensuing uh, assumption is that the ciphertext case carries the message that was encrypted not the message that the sender wished to encrypt, obviously. And, uh, and the assumption is that the sender is free to pick the message to be encrypted, okay? So we have these two assumptions, that you can keep your key secret and that you are free to pick the message to encrypt. Okay, so, so why is this a problem? It's, you know, most of our results are conditional anyway, so maybe, you know, this is a classical theorem from uh, from um, from a textbook. Instead of saying, you know, assume existence of one-way functions, and then you say, oh, assume existence of one-way function and receiver privacy, then there exists uh, secure symmetric encryption schemes, something like that. So we have two assumption, we have one-way function, and we just make it explicit, the ability to hide my key, okay? The problem is that the two assumptions are quite different in nature. The first assumption, existence of one-way function, uh, derives from our understanding of nature. And it's something that, if true, is going to be there and it's enforced by nature and nobody can do anything about it. And if it's false, if there are no one-way function, then there are no one-way function for anyone, okay? The second assumption instead is enforced by political power. In the sense it can be changed by law and decree. Like, you know, if I became a dictator, I could have a decree and say, oh, it's illegal for you to hide your secret key from me. Okay. And then it could and then in this change, in this sense, it changes, but not for everybody, just for some of us, but not for all. And especially it will create a, an asymmetry between the dictator and the regular citizens. So, uh, so this is a difference between law of nature, like existence of one-way function and uh, normative prescriptions, okay? So both assumptions are realistic in normal settings. I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on this. And so no wonder since we live in, uh, uh, in good countries in a sense, and uh, this, you know, most of cryptography has been developed under this assumption. But this is not always true. Like in a dictatorship, there is a very famous XKCD uh, cartoon, which I think most of us know that, you know, they say, you know, this is what we crypto nerds imagination say, oh my God, it's encrypted with RSA, it's gonna take, you know, millennia to, to break. And then the guy on the right, that's okay, just hit him on the head until he gives you uh, the, the secret key. And this is what, you know, that's what we think we are. And that's uh, on the right, that's what we want 
to achieve. Even if someone is going to hit us on the on the head with the key, with with the, with the wrench, then we are not going to surrender the key. Or if we do, that will be useless. And uh, that's for receiver privacy and also for sender freedom. Uh, citizens might be invited to send some messages. Like, for example, I don't know if you have followed, there was a case which is not clear about a tennis player, which sent messages to the president saying that she's fine, but it's not clear if that message was, was, uh, was a real message or was something she was invited to send. Okay. As I said, the case is clear for dictators, but also in uh, um, what I call the regular countries or other countries, there has been an ongoing um, thread of activities that tried to regulate, limit, uh, cripple encryption. And, and this became more or less evident in, in mid nineties uh, with the clipper, the clipper chip initiative by the US. And uh, this go under the name of crypto wars. There is this war between um, mostly law enforcement that, you know, they fear that uh, encryption will give an advantage to the bad guys and they want somehow to limit and regulate the use of encryption. And in fact, there, have, there has been a lots of work in the community. I just mentioned uh, two uh, you know, the earliest work that I'm aware of, it's uh, by Silvio Micali in 92 about fair crypto system. And there is uh, from last Eurocrypt, I guess, uh, this work about Arleas. And they try to use um, cryptographic tools and normative, um, normative prescription to, to try to, you know, limit the use, but under uh, the rule of the judiciary. The problem is that in a dictatorship, there is no independent judiciary system. So if there is no one where the police or the dictator should go and get you know, a, a warrant and say, okay, now you are going to give me your keys. And, uh, and it's not clear that if we put this schemes in place, then maybe the political regime will change and then will give a very strong tool to the dictator. Uh, the concept of crypto wars is also uh, related to kleptography, a concept uh, invented by Adam Young and Moti Young. And also there is some uh, a very uh, related stream of work on subvertible encryption, which actually is uh, tries to address the dual problem that we're trying to address. Okay, so how can we fix this? Suppose that we want to, to give tools that can be resistant to dictators. Of course, we cannot, this is the first observation, we cannot just come up with a new scheme because then what is the dictator going to do? Suppose that I come up, okay, there is this crypto paper and you know, dictator, this crypto paper uh, is, uh, gives you an encryption scheme, which, you know, even if you try to get the secret key, even if you force me, we can get around. The first thing the dictator will do is going to make this scheme illegal, okay? So rather we suggest we should look at existing, scheme, existing schemes, and show that these schemes, as they are, they can be used as they are or modified in an undetectable way, can be used to get around these two problems. Indeed, the existing schemes cannot be disallowed because they've been already uh, deployed and there are some legitimate use. But even if he wants to disallow the schemes, then we'll make the dictator really register to every euro crypto and crypto to check what, what we have been doing and then keep a list of what is going to be, which is very inconvenient if you are a dictator. At least that's what we hope. Okay, so what is our approach? Let's look at the receiver privacy. Receiver privacy when you get hit on the head, okay, to surrender your key. So, so there are two constraints, like the dictators has the secret key and it can decrypt and read the message. But, okay, this works in our favor, only messages that are being encrypted with the key that is given to the, 
to the to the dictator. So our approach is to have to dream of something like a ciphertext is actually associated with two keys. And the ciphertext carries two messages, one with respect to each of the two keys, M0 and M1. And in a sense, there is no second key. In the sense, that's at least what the dictator thinks, that there is no second key. And that's what we can uh, quite easily deny that there exists such a key. I'll just give you an example right now. This example uh, also appeared under a different name in the literature, uh, like for example, it's on the work by Bellar Patterson and Rogaway in crypto a few years ago, and it's for the dual problem for subvertible encryption. And it also appeared very recently in the in the in this work in, in innovation theory of computer science by Horrell Park, Reiselson, and uh, by Kuntanandam. Okay, we not. Okay, so just take any encryption scheme, okay? This is the normal mode. I don't have to go the, uh, through the bullets because that's what, what we have. Now, suppose that, Alice wants to send a message, you know, glory to our leader, okay? But she wants, to, just for the sake of this example, just to, she wants also to send, uh, no, no, that's Bob. Bob wants to send one bit to Alice, okay? So how does he do it? Okay, so Alice and Bob share the, a seed K for a pseudorandom function. So when Bob sends, the message glory to our leader, he keeps sampling uh, ciphertext until he gets a ciphertext that evaluates to be the bits that he wants to send under the shared seed. Okay. As you can see, this, this is going to work because, you know, E, that's a, just a regular, just think of it as AS, for example, for secret key or, you know, El Gamal, whatever, you know, RSA or AP. And um, the dictator uh, just sees normal communication. And even if Alice surrenders the key for the encryption scheme, then, uh, you know, the dictator will see, oh, glory to our leader. And if the dictator says, oh, okay, no, no, give me the seed that you shared with Alice, well, with Bob, Alice could say, you know, what seed? There is no seed. Okay, I'm just using AS. I'm just using RSA or AP. Okay, so this is a feasibility in the sense that what we were dreaming of actually actually exists. And uh, yeah, this is a theorem. And of course, there are some, uh, uh, there are some restrictions as you can imagine, like uh, it can be extended to any length, you just keep sampling, but of course this is gonna be exponential. The expected time is going to be exponential in the length. We call um, schemes like this, we call it, receiver anamorphic. Why? Because, you know, there is a normal mode and anamorphic mode. Anamorphic images are those that, you know, give you different images depending on the angle on which you, you, you look at them. Okay, so, so for the dictator, it's the normal mode. For Alice and Bob, there is the anamorphic mode. So we call them receiver anamorphic. And then we'll be sender anamorphic to address the second problem, the sender freedom problem. In fact, these are the, our two technical contribution. We're going to give a receiver anamorphic for many bits, polynomial time. Um, rejection sampling only works for few bits. And we're going to give sender anamorphic with no shared key. Remember that in rejection sampling, as well in the one that we're going to show next, uh, Alice and Bob have to agree on, on the seed, okay? Here, instead, in sender anamorphic, we are going to do we are going to do this completely with no prior communication, and for this we need some extra property. And we'll see those. Okay, we take the Naur Jung encryption scheme. This is an encryption scheme uh, that uh, provides CCA security, CCA one, CCA two, depending on the strength of the needs. And we're not going to this detail, but this is the slide. Uh, that describes Naor Jung. I think that most of us, uh, you know, they keep it in mind, but they, they have it in mind. But, you know, just for uh, to refresh, there are two public keys, but there is only one secret key. Okay. 
and, and, and actually this is crucial in the in the proof of security so if you want to encrypt a message like glory to our leader so you what do you do you encrypt it with the first public key you encrypt it with the second public key then you produce a proof that the two are consistent and then you send it upon decryption uh, you know upon arrival of the ciphertext alice checks the proof and then it decrypts the first one Alice has no second decryption key. Actually, uh, you know, for example, for Elgamal, you can sample a public key without having the corresponding secret key. But okay, so this is the normal mode. What is the? Uh, I'm sure that now it comes. To, you know, most of you got it already. Because what is the anamorphic? The anamorphic is the following. Like, okay, Alice actually keeps both secret keys. Okay, and now when uh, uh, Bob wants to send a message. He sends on the first secret key, you know, the official secret key, you know, glory to our leader. And then he sends, you know, fine to our leader, you know, just uh, fine our leader for illegal parking, maybe. That, I, I don't know what they mean. Okay. And the secret, the secret shared information is the simulator trapdoor. Okay. So instead of uh, having a sigma, a, a, a truly random string, or you know a string from uh, the right distribution depending on the underlying needs so what they do alice runs the simulator gets a string which is indistinguishable from what it should be and gets a trapdoor alice and bob share the trapdoor that allows bob to produce a needs a fake needs a cheating needs that the two messages are equal okay so now when the dictator knocks on Alice's door, do, you know, said, okay, yes, I have SK0. That's all, you know, that's what now Jung told me to do, okay? And that's it. And the dictator decrypts and say, oh, go, go to Tower. Oh, well, these are good kids, okay? And um, while Alice has also SK1 and decrypts, and decrypts the real message, okay? Let's find the, our leader, okay? Now you can see that, um, okay, why does this work? Okay, the uh, properties of needs, different flavors of needs that you want to do, simulation sound and so on, depending on that. But this implies that anamorphic and normal public keys are indistinguishable. Uh, needs plus in CPA imply that the ciphertexts are indistinguishable. So the fact that they are not the same ciphertext, but they are different, of course, this is hidden. And uh, of course, this is what I said. PK1 could be generated without associated uh, secret key. So Alice could, you know, she said, oh, no, I'm just following the protocol. I'm just, uh, you know, following the what's on the paper. And I have no SK1. Okay. Okay. And the other line, the PK0, PK1, Sigma, and AUX, AUX is the trapdoor, is can be proved to be a symmetric encryption keys. All, all the proofs are in the paper, the paper is on ePrint uh, and uh, in the proceedings. So, but I, I'm not getting into proofs now. Okay, so let's come to the, to the final, uh, the sender freedom assumption. Uh, here we assume in this assumption, we assume the sender is free to pick the message. Which you can, you know, you can be fought like you have a, a, a gun at your head, and then you say, okay, just send a message that everything is fine, okay, that you are free to move, and then uh, you, you know, nobody should worry about that. Okay, so this is a story of Oscar and John. Oscar is a, a political, you know, position leader, okay. And then at one point, there are, you know, oh, this opposition leader is being persecuted by the dictator. The dictator wants to look good to the, to the world public opinion. So he just goes to Oscar and says, hey, Oscar, why don't you send a message? I'm fine and in good health. Okay. So what can he do? With the two a fourth public key, FPK. FPK could be, you know, like the public key of uh, some media outlet, you know, Bloomberg, uh, you know. Rai Uno or uh, whatever, CNN. Oscar was, wants also to send a message, hey, I'm in prison. And he wants to send a message to his friend or to a journalist, not necessarily his friend, called John, okay? And John has, you know, his public key, DPK. The public key is up there. It's well known to everybody. It's, it's on, the, on the website. And Oscar and John have not talked beforehand he just says okay 
Oh, there is this guy that seems to, to look good. Okay, and John, so Oscar computes, Oscar, Oscar does the following. He computes some special coin tosses R star, such that the ciphertext CT encrypts a message M0, that's the dictator picked message, say, oh, I'm fine, I'm in good health, and it's sent to the fourth public key, so that you know the official media outlet gets this message, R star, but it also holds that if John tries to decrypt the same ciphertext, but with this secret key, then he gets M1. So this is again anamorphic, depending on uh, under which angle you look at the ciphertext, and you know, depending on which secret key you're going to use to decrypt, you get two different messages, but it's one ciphertext. And of course, John knows that his key might be used to uh, to receive some uh, some messages from opposition leaders, and then it decrypts also messages that he sees broadcast on the network. Okay, and I want to stress that there is no prior shared knowledge between Oscar and John. Okay, they don't tell you. You know, this is different from uh, Naor Jung and rejection sampling. Okay, can we achieve this? Oh, of course, like. Uh, uh, R star is going to be chosen by Oscar because if the dictator picks the randomness and the message, of course, there is no, no room to maneuver, of course. There, you know, then it becomes a deterministic function and there is nothing we can do. Okay. So uh, before you know, giving you the result, I, I want to uh, just elaborate about sender anamorphic and deniable encryption. First of all, if you remember the deniable encryption from 97, the Canetti, Canetti et al. paper, um, that, that applies to the same public key, okay? And, uh, and this is, it's, it's impossible uh, for standard encryption, okay? Which contradicts one of our main objectives. And suppose in standard anamorphic it can be used to provide some form of deniability, but this is in a different context. Now, the context is messages being broadcast on the network while um, deniable encryption was for point-to-point -point communication, which in a sense uh, justifies their assumption of being denial with the same public key. Okay. So these are sufficient conditions for standard anamorphic uh, with no shared key. Okay, so we have these three conditions, which are uh, quite uh, quite reasonable. First of all, we have this property, common randomness property, like for any uh, ciphertext and any other public key PK prime, or ciphertext C is a valid ciphertext also under PK prime. Um, the second property is message recovery from randomness, that if I give you ciphertext and the randomness that has been used, then you can recover the message. And the third is equal distribution of plain text, meaning that um, for any given C and for randomly generator SK, the probability that C is uh, uh, an encryption of zero or an encryption of one is more or less the same. Okay, so under this, uh, we prove that these three conditions are sufficient for what we want to achieve. And then we go on and prove, but uh, details are in the, in the paper, but, and I'm not going to discuss this, that uh, two very well-known uh, encryption schemes based on LWE, uh, Regev from 205 and the Gentry, Pikert and Vinod from 208, uh, they satisfy these three condition and thus they can be used um, as standard anamorphic encryption schemes. Okay, so um, now to the last slide. And okay, so I'm doing pretty well on time, I guess. Yep, uh, we started a little bit earlier, but uh, okay. So these are the conclusions. So we introduced uh, two new concepts, receiver anamorphic and sender anamorphic. So the receiver anamorphic is useful in, uh, in settings where the receiver of a communication is under the dictator's control. While the sender anamorphic is when at the sender of the message is under the dictator's control. Okay. 
uh, we show implementations of these two concepts with existing uh, crypto system from the literature. Okay, so that we, you know, I don't know if anybody's using in our Jung right now, but you know, in principle, you you could use it, and and that's the I think that uh, we think the most important point of our um, of our work is that we give technical evidence that this the futility the stupidity of the crypto wars like encryption is the technology that is there and there is no point in trying to regulate to make it weaker or to have a control a state control on that like uh, encryption is staying is there and then if you try to do something there is something you know we have a way to go around whatever the dictator or the good government does uh, for your, your own uh, good and uh and if uh, the dictator really wants to pursue this, at least he'll have to register to all crypto in Eurocrypt and read all the proceeding. His kids should get a, a PhD in crypto, and okay, and that could be also a good a, a good result. How? And so uh, how how this is going to affect policy, law, and other societal aspects? You know, of course, this is beyond. Uh, you know, our expertise, it's not in our ballpark, this is not the right forum, but it's just a technical contribution, like, uh, you know, uh, none of the three of us is uh, is a social scientist that, that I know, and uh, so, of course, but I think that uh, it's important to to say that you know encryption is here to stay. It's like, you know, when fast cars were introduced, like, I don't know if back then, you know, the police complain, oh, now they have fast cars uh, instead of horses. And, you know, in the horses, you know, you could, you know, just go there. And then now with fast cars, so who knows, they're going to rob a bank. And then let's pass a law by which no car can be faster than the police car, which, you know, now, you know, said like that is completely, you know, very silly. And, uh, and that's in a sense what they're trying to do with encryption. Okay. Also, um, the last bullet is that anamorphic encryption is not a bizarre phenomenon. Like uh, we have seen it in, uh, in some very well known and studied uh, crypto system. There is nothing pathological in our constructions. And uh, you know, there is more to come, there is work in progress. <laughs> and we would like to see uh, you know, more uh, non-crypto system to be proved to be anamorphic. And uh, just to complete the whole program of showing the futility of the crypto wars. And uh, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for being here in the last session. Okay. Questions? Yeah, maybe you can use one of the mic. You can... you can use this one. Um, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so on the technical level, it seems that to uh, achieve receiver anamorphic encryption or even the sender anamorphic encryption, you need to share some information between the parties. So in particular, for the receiver case, you need to share the trapdoor for the NISIC. Mm -hmm. And for the sender, you need to share the randomness, right? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, but uh, at least for the receiver, you need to share yes, the trapdoor. Right? That, that I agree. So um, how do you assume that to do you assume like an underlying anamorphic key exchange or a key transport protocol that does it okay that, that's a good question okay first of all i, I want to make sure maybe i i was not i, I didn't say it uh clearly here uh no it's not this one okay so Okay, so I, I cannot find the job. So for sender anamorphic, there is no shared communication. Like the sender by himself, uh, by himself picks uh, a special R star, but there is no way, uh, there is no need to agree on the R star beforehand with uh, with with the receiver. Uh, for uh, how do you get? How do like for receiver? How do you agree on on the seed of the pseudo random function or on the, on the trapdoor of the random? Function? Okay, so uh, so we think uh, the setting that we had in mind is that it, this is a group of opposition leaders, uh, opposition uh, uh, activists, and that they they get together at one point and they just share 
the, uh, the, the, the you know this information. I must say that the paper of Horel et al. does exactly what you what you what you describe in the sense that they have some sort of steganographic um, uh, key exchange. Okay, but you know uh, you, you have to see maybe in different settings things have different uh, uh, ways. But then uh, first of all, you have to start a secret sharing a, a, a key sharing protocol, which might attract some stuff, uh, you know, some suspicion from the dictator. And also, uh, it's very low rate. The so they takes long time to uh, to agree on the key. And so post hours, uh, we have this concept in the paper about latency, uh, our says zero latency. The moment you have the two keys, then you can start. But, you know, these are uh, very good questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks good. for the interesting talk. Uh, my question uh, is about the non-interactive zero-knowledge proof that uh, the uh, dictator verifies. Uh, so uh, is it uh, only specific kind of non-interactive zero-knowledge proof uh, techniques can be uh, used in anonymous encryption schemes or any uh, schemes can be used? No, a, a, no, any needs, then, be, okay, of course you should get, you know, if you want CCA2, you want simulation soundness, you know, that, but a, any needs will work. It's, it's generic in that respect. Any needs for which there is a simulator, okay? So it has to be zero knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Don. Hello. You know, great. Uh, uh, I love this name. I'm not sure if I love this name exactly. It's very catchy. It's kind of cool. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware. Uh, in the mid '90s, there was another paper called "Plausible Deniability," which took the same tack, uh, which is kind of looking at a crypto system and finding ways to use it in, in uh, deniable uh, method kind of like cdno post-dated cdno mm -hmm. but the idea was to say let's use this in a way that people are not expecting it to be used so there's there, there's this one aspect of this it was about the wheat about the time that wheat and chaff came out as published in progo crypt i'm wondering what the differences there might be it also is using sort of a trapdoor oh, thing yeah yeah uh, and and the other half of it too is uh the other question which is maybe a more uncomfortable question which is how do these things really resist sort of the the screwdriver attack which is the the dictator just comes and says what is your alternative key what is your alternative key what is your alternative key and applies a screwdriver every single time until you actually give it up okay okay yeah okay uh, you know two good points about the second one yeah but the uh if the dictators does that he could really you know very well get into someone who is innocent and doesn't have a key so and it's going to create a, a you know terror in the population, which is something that he might enjoy, by the way. So, so I'm not saying that you know this is going to solve all the problems, but at least there is reasonable doubt that you know I'm just using AS. There is no speed. Okay, uh, leave me alone. So, but that's it. about the first one. Maybe we should talk because uh, uh, maybe we missed. We, you know, there are several references and we do comparison. So maybe we we take it offline. Uh, we'll take it offside and we discuss it. Thanks, Pino. Okay, I got a screwdriver. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for this talk. It's really really interesting. Um, one thing that occurred to me uh, while listening to your talk is that. Um, Dictators do show up at Eurocrypt and crypto. Um, we know with a lot of certainty there's records from the NSA during the Snowden leaks that they come to Eurocrypt and we're like, hey, they're not working on anything interesting. Don't worry about it. Keep going. Um, and certainly in conferences in the US, there's always a DOD person who shows up in the back of the room. Um, and so in light of that, I'm wondering uh, to what extent you've been able to characterize the necessary conditions for these kinds of uh, communication uh, protocols, anamorphic encryption, like do we know that if we don't use anything, if, if the government says no LWE ever, we're done with LWE, um, can we not do anamorphic encryption? Is there some kind of like minimum entropy in a channel that we need, uh, similar to like steganographic techniques, or is that kind of like an open question that's that's we want to look at next? Yeah, yeah, no, no, right, uh, terrific questions. These are all questions for for uh, next work, and uh, these are uh, great. So now I don't know. I'm looking at back rows. Maybe and... they don't come to Europe. I don't know. Okay. It's hard to get uh, a visa or something. But... Okay. 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 So we'll see in 15 years. So, you know, when the release the... Thank you. Thank you. So I have a uh, quick question. So sure. what is the connection to steganography? Steganography also says that you can take basically any randomized encryption and by playing with the randomness, you can encode arbitrary messages. 
in the ciphertext. So what is the connection? Yeah, in a sense, like like uh, if the yeah steganography, the dictator could get in and say, okay, you are using steganography. Show me uh, this, and also um, with steganography on the receiver side, it could have you know you could get the key and the sender from the sender anamorphic we have this property where you can send it to any other secret uh, public key which for which you had no while steganography you cannot do that like steganography is point to point so there are some differences which uh, but i agree it's it's very common uh they're very close as concept but you know our emphasis on is on existing scheme is not on designing new schemes Okay, so we are anyway out of time. So this is the end of the session. Let's thank both the speakers again.